So uh, I think the key line in the movie that leaps out to me is, how did you get to be this person that you are? Um, uh -huh. and, and I think the unspoken question maybe of the movie is, how did this country get to be the country that it is right uh -huh. now? Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how those two things dovetail? Uh -huh. That's what Dorothea says to William. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so. um, well, I feel like the key, how did you get to be this person you be? Yeah, sure. It's how, to, how did I get to become the person I am? How did, yeah, how did I get to be this person? What's the history of me? Mm. And, uh, and is it the right story? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> how, did I, how did I get this story of who I am in my head? Yeah. I think that's maybe the key thing. And then people are trying to figure that out or unravel it by telling it to the other people. So it's like in relationship that they're figuring themselves out. And then, um, how did we get to be in this moment of history? Yeah. And you're talking about 79 or you're talking about now? Well, that's the or thing. Is, echo? Uh, yeah, how, how did we get? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think by the way you look at 1979, you're, yeah. you're reminding us of where we were then and how we had to be there to be where we are now. And yeah. That, that, that was a turning point, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a turning point. To now, yeah, right. I feel like it, you can kind of describe it as the beginning of now, mm -hmm. uh, and the, and the end of like, the end of the sort of countercultural hippie movement, but also in a larger way, the beginning of the end of sort of post World War II industrial built America, mm -hmm. and that's part of why I had the car burning at the beginning, mm -hmm. kind of like the beginning of the end of Detroit and unions, mm -hmm. the beginning of the end of middle class, working class in terms of its power and representation, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then this enormous change from like Carter being, what is Carter? He's sort of like a computer virus to masculinity, right? <laughs> or, yeah. or patriarchy, and, and as a presidential figure, right? Right. He's just too soft and gentle and, and contemplative and emotional and emitting doubt and failure to be a good father figure yeah. in America's eyes, right? Right. And then, and then Reagan came in with this like master narrative. I got it. <laughs> right. And America's great again. And so America's great again now. Um, <laughs> I, I think the... I mean, that, was, that is a funny parallel that no one's actually brought up that that was Reagan's line. Mm. America great again, right? And right. Trump just very knowingly, you know, just uh, outsourced it. Um, uh, the thing about history that I find really interesting or got my interest in writing the script was how we're constantly getting our future wrong or we're constantly not knowing the moment that we're in and it's slipping out from under us mm -hmm. before we barely got an understanding of what it was. And we think that's such a contemporary feeling because of the internet and sort right. of accelerated speed. But in the 70s, we're also feeling that there's this book, Future Shock, that everyone's reading that was about... Alvin Toffler. Yeah, that life is going too fast and that we just can't absorb it all. And it used to be in my film, a fair, Dorothea Reed's uh, Alvin Toffler. My, 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 it's not in the edited version of the film, mm -hmm. but it's part of the DNA of the movie. Right. Um, and well, yeah, it deals with the relativity of time. Yes, this idea that like time isn't moving just at the pace that it goes, but it, it seems faster, it seems to be speeding up on you. Yeah. And how that sort of also somehow is part of the march of history to the rhythm of our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also that we are always surprised and horrible at predicting our personal, our personal mm -hmm. future. And our, our itinerary, our biography, what, the way we think our life is going to go. Yeah. Uh, at least in my experience, it just doesn't work out like that. And then, uh, as a as a culture, we're really none of us in '79 really understood the internet was coming, mm -hmm. and what a huge change of consciousness that would be. Um, in just so many ways, we didn't see Reagan coming. We did, we don't. I feel like we're just particularly bad at uh, our guesses at the future as a species. It's like part of our thing. Yeah. Um, so each of the titular characters, the 20th century women, there's three of them representing three generations, is entirely specific as a character. And, and uh, the Annette Bening character is partly based on your mother, mm -hmm. and uh, the Greta Gerwig character is partly based on a friend of yours. My right? sister. Oh, your sister, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then uh, the Elle Fanning character is based uh, partly on uh, girls you knew yeah, yeah. in your own youth. Uh, and yet, I imagine in the writing of it that they came to represent something archetypal for you as well. So, 
Can you talk a bit about, well, is that true, first of all? Yeah, I wouldn't quite call it archetypal, but it, so they came from this real source. And, and I tend to write that way, and I tend to trust things I've seen or known or have like some long relationship with. And I like um, trying to get people I've known right on the screen. Mm. Like that seems like a noble project, like trying to make a decent portrait of someone, understanding that portraits are kind of impossible. Mm. Like people are way more complicated and paradoxical than you could ever capture, right? But that just kind of keeps me mentally healthy and sane and gives me North Poles, <laughs> maybe more than one. <laughs> Like, if, if I have a lived person that I can go, like, mm, that's not right, or that's right, or, and, and there's these qualities about them that are very, like, most screenwriters just wouldn't want to put into a story. They don't seem important enough, they don't seem good enough for structure, like Robert McKee, the famous <laughs> Hollywood, would just shoot him down. Uh -huh. And I like those kinds of things, because I feel like they feel really real and lived in, and they give you real access to the person, they just feel really real and <laughs> honest or something like that. So I'm starting from this very real place. They just happen to be these kinds of ages. And yes, I did sort of notice, like, okay, not so much like archetypes, but like it gives me a chance to talk about their different feminisms mm. or the different mm. um, moments, different language of empowering themselves or different ways of, mm. of trying to be free and like just themselves, mm. put it that way. Because if the movie really is like a self-discovery movie or a movie about who am I movie, it, it just... Like, you know, if you're 16 in 1979, and if you're 28, and if you're 55, your worldview, due to where you were in history, mm -hmm. is really radically different. And that just kind of, it was a byproduct of my working from real people mm -hmm. that I did lean into or whatever. Like, I did sort of um, get that that would help me in terms of conflict, mm -hmm. and as a way to talk about each one's worldview. Like, if you have difference, it just makes it easier to talk about the particulars of each side. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, your relationship with the actors as a director, how that might be. It seems like it would be an especially intense and sort of maybe not unique, but uh, unusual relationship mm. with the actor where, uh, with Annette Benning in mm. this case, and uh, Lucas Zuman, mm. uh, and on Beginners with. Christopher yeah. Plummer and Ewan McGregor, where they you would be telling them story after story about, yeah. they would be wanting to pick your brain, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that would be sort of a different or a more intimate relationship with the actor. Maybe some of the usual clutter would go away, and it would be a different kind of process than. I think to work. It's, yeah, I think yeah. as intimate as anyone, any writer director. That's where I level of intimacy, mm -hmm. right? That's a director that didn't write it. It's a different game. Mm -hmm. um, but the first thing I do with all, because I write personal material, I feel like this huge uh, need or really important thing for me to do is to say, this isn't precious, this isn't like, you're not imitating anybody, you're not mimicking anyone. I, I did this this way to make hopefully like something real and unique feeling or like with specificity, mm -hmm. at the very least, like with detail and specificity that you feel free to exploit, you know, but if it, if they're like walking on eggshells in front of the camera because of me and my story and all that, it's like the nightmare, you know, and they never are. Luckily, they never, it was never like that. And so it's a big deal for me to say like, it's yours now. These, this isn't me, this mm -hmm. isn't my mom. This like, started off as a version of my mom by the time I wrote it, ca wrote it cast it, all that. It can feed the performance, you know? And, and both Annette and, and Christopher did like hearing stories about the real person. Um, but it was like, whatever, it's my job and it's incredibly important for me to like take the preciousness out mm -hmm. of it somehow. Yeah, and well that frees up the actor. Too. Yeah. yeah, and even just like my first movie, I, it wasn't about my life, but as a writer-director, it's very important to go like, it's yours now. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to say every word that I wrote exactly as I wrote it. I'm not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of a filmmaker. And <clears throat> it has to get under their skin. It has to like, they have to like, it has to feel like their language and, coming out of their mouth. And also, like, their urgency, their mm -hmm. life, like, their, their, they need to start taking care of the character. If I'm on my game as a director, if I'm being a good director, and someone says, well, Mike, what, like, Ned says, Mike, what would she do here? Which Annette never says, let's be honest. Just, <laughs> Annette has a very strong idea of everything. But if she said something like that, my, if I'm on my game, I'd say, well, what do you think? You know, because it's, like, up to her instincts I need to lay into her instincts. I need to like let her instincts feed the character and give them strength and like bolster them mm -hmm. so that she can take control and, and anybody, 
any character, even a small character. I feel like that's the, the for me, that's the directing process. Mm. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, the actor's varying uh, processes, mm -hmm. uh, like, like how Annette Bening works uh, uh -huh. as an actress as opposed to, say, Billy Crudup or yeah. Al Fanning? They, they weirdly share, maybe it's because we're all together and I like this, but they all, sh the one thing they share is they're really down for like surprises in the moment and hunting for the weird thing in the moment and mm -hmm. not knowing everything and not being like, uh, like too careful or rigid. You know, we prepare a lot, but they're hunting for like the thing that feels real that you can never have predicted and never described, and it's beyond words, you know, and planning. <coughs> and that, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I have a <coughs> cold and carrying with me. <laughs> it's all right. <coughs> <coughs> and that is um, <coughs> kind of a mysterious. <coughs> Sorry. This okay. I think water's on the way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and that is a Gemini. A Gemini, like, and my mother's a Gemini. And, and Geminis don't want you to know everything about them. <laughs> and that part of her process is a secretive thing. Mm. And, and she's not going to let you look all the way in there. Mm. And it took me a minute to figure that out. And I was like, ah, oh, but then it's very easy to respect that. That's like, each person has their own really different process. Yeah. Uh, Greta and Billy are the kind of like actor that just want to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. We laugh and we cry all in rehearsals, like we <laughs> share our lives, and I adore, I adore doing that, so uh -huh. that's fine. And Elle's on her, I think, on her way to being that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Elle's completely open, um, but maybe didn't come from the same kind of school or uh -huh. just can't, has her own course in life. But Elle's instincts and Elle's has a deep um, connection to like her intuition and and working and works from like a very real place mm -hmm. like it's not like a I know how to act it's where it's much more in her body and in her mm -hmm. uh, and Lucas is kind of brand new and just sort of like figured, learned it, the job on the job which works very much in his favor for this role yeah yeah yeah, yeah luckily yeah yeah <laughs> um, I want to talk about uh, your visual approach as well you're very uh, kind of hyper visual filmmaker because you come from the art world as well mm -hmm. um, uh, your use of montage is very uh, strong in the film. It's a very uh, skillfully kind of constructed film. Um, and also things like um, the use of fast mo, which has mm. not, not gotten as close to cliche as slow mo yet. Mm. Um, can you just talk about, I guess uh, to me, a lot of that reflected, again, uh, time and history, right? Yeah. Like, in a lot of ways, it looks like a film that could have been made in 1979, yeah. and yet there's also this influence of punk creeping in and, and the emergence of music video. It, yeah. Anyway, can, how conscious was all of that? Uh, well, I do, I'm a big film nerd buff mm -hmm. person, and I, uh, I make films a lot to like kind of, because other films excited me. And I'm not like a super big quarter film, you know, yeah. but I do, I do seeps. make... Seeps in. Seeps in, and I'm happy for it too. And I love the company of my Criterion collection. <laughs> I love the company of other directors, right? right? And it's a non reciprocal love affair, like they're all. <laughs> but, like, um, a lot of what you're talking about, I don't know if you know, um, uh, Armano Olmi, who did like uh, Finanzati, or he did Il oh, Posto. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Finanzati has a time structure, time sense that's very similar to mine. Like, mm. It's like emotional time, not linear time, but it basically goes forward. You know, it's yeah. not like totally. It's not like the mirror. It's not Tarkovsky, but it's. Yeah. Um, and I love that movie, and I feel like I'm very much in his, you know, whatever. Like I've learned a lot. And Resnais, like the war is over. Mm -hmm. Hiroshima, one more. And Hiroshima, one more. The way it's structured, where you <clears throat> learn all the stuff about the character deep into the movie. Yeah. And to call it a flashback would be like to really misunderstand it or call it a montage would be mm -hmm. to diminutize it in mm -hmm. his movie. It's like it's the heart of the movie. Yeah. Same thing like Truffaut and Shoot the Piano Player, like way into the movie there's this fifteen, twenty minute bio of the main yeah. character that kinda comes out of nowhere. <clears throat> and I love things like that. They yeah. make, make movies really alive for me. Um and then yeah, so... And, and, and I heard Fel Fellini, too. Fellini's really big for me, like Amicord, the structure of Amicord. Uh -huh. It's like a group portrait, and every once in a while a different person will talk to the camera. Mm -hmm. So just that idea of um, shift, not decentralizing, you know, 
Yeah, well, your film starts with they swap narration yeah. with the lead characters, yeah. Yeah, which is a great entry point. Yeah, and that came, it used to be just Annette's character saying that. Mm -hmm. And then I needed to show people that this film at heart is sort of about their relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it became a duet, and it was easy to make it a duet. Yeah. And people liked it, I tried it, and people were like, oh, you know. Uh, but also, then again, that's also like Tout Va Bien, the, the Godard film, the beginning of that, yeah. is that there's a kind of a back and forth duet between a male character and a female character, narrating the beginning of the film, sort of setting up the story, and showing you all these very like kind of almost didactic, expositional shots that represent sort of objects and factories and like the story, and then people writing checks for the amount of money that the film's going to cost to make, yeah. and all, all those moves I love, hmm. you know. And that's the cinema that, when you go to art school, the films that you watch on Friday night aren't, aren't um, you know, Hawks and Ford and mm. Scorsese. It's mm. Godard, Truffaut, yeah. Fellini, Tchaikovsky, yeah. you know, that stuff. And that, and that made a big impression on me. Um, in going back to your past, um, were there specific memories that you, that you ended up kind of dropping into the script uh, and recreating, uh, or... Did, did most of the moments of grace, as it were, uh, were they really fictional uh, attempts to capture that idea? Yeah, there. so my last movie, Beginners, there's a lot of like real direct memories that I just mm -hmm. cinematized, like mm -hmm. really translated. This happened so much longer ago, the memories are more kind of personal mythologies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of direct quotes from my mom. The biography of the <coughs> characters is very real. Like, my mom was a draft person, the first woman to be a draft person and in our company, in the, in the Container Corporation of America. She wanted to be a pilot in World War II. She did carve that rabbit. She, yeah. she does smoke Salem. She does smoke Salem. She does work Birkenstocks. A lot of the facts are all very true. Yeah. Same thing with Abby's character. Same thing with Els. Like, there's a real sort of documentary strand in there. Um, but, and my mom did say things all the time, like, in my next life, I'm going to marry Humphrey Bogart. Uh, not exactly like that, not as it appears in the scene. So they're just, like, transposing and, and finding things that are real and finding a way to, to cinematize it, like, to put it into a movie. Yeah. And that's another way it feels very Fellini-ish to me. Mm -hmm. Like, this movie, of my work, feels the most, like, movie-like to me, or, like... And also, I had, I watched a lot of Hawks and, like, Casablanca and a lot of... 30s and 40s films that figure out my mom's character. My mom really watched those movies. Mm -hmm. It's from that time. And I really fell in love with that whole thing. And that whole, like, like Thin Man, 20th Century Limited, Stage Drawer, all these, all the Curtiz films. Like, they're just not, they just love entertaining. And it's like, yeah. it's okay to entertain, and they're super entertaining. And so my movies are infused with a moviness, <laughs> both 30s and 40s yeah. and Fellini. That, that I didn't quite see coming that came out of my like loving yeah. studying these films and Fellini you can tell that, like the real memories or the real moments in his life but then he makes them kind of grand or he he turns them into cinema mm -hmm. and I'm not making him as grand but I'm mm -hmm. doing something yeah. in, that, in that river yeah, yeah. Um, well we got to wrap up here but I, I guess I'll wrap up by asking is there a moment of grace from the process of making the film that <laughs> leaps out to you <laughs> moment of grace for me yeah oof well there's lots of little ones there's lots of little ones there's like um so as a director when you're on set you're like bombarded all the time and yeah. I love that it's fine this is, it's not going to be too much information <laughs> there's moments when you have to go pee <laughs> it's like you're alone for a minute yeah and you're like either in a porta potty or yeah. in some room in the house and I often find those moments really kind of magical because like <laughs> the war stops for a second and you're like oh my god I'm making this movie about these women I love and it's really a huge cultural privilege to get to make a film of any kind and then to fight your way into making this weird one like yeah. um, I like we premiered at the New York Film Festival at the, or like a centerpiece screening thing and that was a big deal for me I, I went to college in New York and learned that I wanted to be a filmmaker in New York and um, and it went really well like the audience liked the movie a lot and that was a super moment of grace like I, I can't watch the movie. It drives me nuts. <laughs> With an audience, anyway, or, anyway, or even on your own. Even on my own. Uh, but I can, I could go up to the door, of the and listen. And it's a little hear. like being in the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> you can kind of hear, hear <laughs> it going need on. Always in a separate room. Yeah. I was with some friends. I was with, so I wasn't alone. So I was with yeah. some good friends, and 
listening through, they'll always remember that. That's like very magical. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking with you yeah. again. Yeah. Uh, great luck with the film. Thanks. Thanks, man.